whole part, this yellow part here, was owned by George Washington, and that was Virginia. This part down here is Maryland. This part up here is Connecticut. So you could have a person that served in Pennsylvania, but their records are going to be from Connecticut for that reason. And George Washington gave this land all the way to the men that served in the Revolutionary War. And they got land grants. And you can find a lot of land grants online. So anyhow, way back when, um, the Taylor brothers, James and Joseph, uh, received land up on the Laurel Mountain. And they each received 400 acres. And if you were an officer, you received anywhere from 400 to 600 acres. If you were a private, you only got 50 to 100 acres of land. So when you are researching that and you see where someone had 100 acres, you could pretty well say they were just a private. So anyhow, Joseph and James each had 400 acres up on Laurel Mountain. And there was a community up there that I was raised in that area. I never knew there was a community in that area. But they start paying taxes as early as 1792. And I'm talking a black community. These weren't white people, these were black people. And uh, how they got there, and how they got their land, some say um, that these were slaves that belonged to the Taylors. And since uh, Maryland had passed some laws, uh, that they moved on to Pennsylvania because they had to claim these people, you know, in their taxes and everything. So I don't know. But in 1762, I have a Jacob Hirschberger that dies in Lancaster. And when he died, he had taken an oath of allegiance to the English king. So he was able to disperse all his lands. Uh, if you did not take that oath of allegiance, you were not able to pass that land on to your family, your sons, your daughters. But he passed everything on, so he took the oath of allegiance. And in there he leaves so much money to the grandkids, so much to his kids, and the kids that he had, the children that had already passed, then the children that that mother or father had got their share of the money. And sometimes he specified that the husband wasn't to receive or the wife wasn't to receive any of the money, just the grandchildren. So anyhow, there is a note, and it said, his daughter Hannah, who has a daughter, it didn't say slavery, but it said when she is set free, and at that time, if you lived in Pennsylvania and you were a black person that had a white parent. You were enslaved for 28 years. And so in his will, he said, when Hannah's daughter is set free, and he had the same amount of money set aside for her as he did all his other grandchildren. Now, it's possible that that Hannah had a daughter by the name of Elizabeth because Jacob's wife's name was Elizabeth. And in naming, you know, people were usually named after relatives and everything else. So in 1828, Elizabeth sets forth from the Lancaster area. And at that time, the canal wasn't, you know, here yet. The canal was started in 1830. But at that time, they left home in the summer, arrived in Johnstown in November, and travel depended on the weather. If you had bad weather and muddy roads, you weren't getting too far. So they arrived here in November of 1928. But Elizabeth's son, William Hirschberger, was already on the hill. He was a blacksmith in the Laurel Hill village. 
whether he came after the Revolutionary War or whatever in uh, one of the histories, a uh, story, I think it is, the man's, I can't remember his first name, but story has those history books. And he states in there that Henry Hirschberger's wife was not white. So I, I don't know how this all comes about. And also in Hirschberger history, Isaac Hirschberger, who was a son of William Henry Hirschberger and Jane Hirschberger. Now Jane is uh, usually listed as Indian, but uh, Isaac was definitely a black man when he was younger. Now a lot of the black people, if they intermarried with whites, they ended up as white. So anyone that lived on that mountain that could pass for white, when they were old enough, they left that mountain. And they passed for white in Altoona and Williamsport and all over this area. But you can trace the name back, you know. And one man I spoke with, he was very, you know, he was livid. And he said, no, no, no. And, you know, th this is part of history. Um, I have grandchildren that are black. I have a son, a grandson, that his roots are all from Slovakia. And he has 2% black in him. So who knows what, you know, what our makeup is. So these people lived very quietly on the hill. And at that time, when you talk about the roads to Bedford, Ligonier, you have to realize that Richland was part of Bedford. And the if you go down and stand on the John Street Bridge, you can see the stones. And they took the stones that were part of that Bedford Pike, or Bedford Road, and they used that as the base for the canal in a lot of places. And when you got down to like Moralville, you would shoot up Fairfield Avenue, that was still part of Bedford Pike, and it went through the lands and over to Ligonier. Now, I showed these pictures to someone over in Lincoln Air, and they said, no, 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 no. So, I don't know. Maybe I'm on the wrong track, but I don't think I am. And these are some pictures. I'll pass them around to everyone. We started, and we went up past St. Uh, Stephen Cemetery, and when you come to that flat part, I, I don't know what the road's called, some people refer to it as the fire tire road, the fire tower road. And as you continue up though, that's Mountain Road. And Mountain Road goes up, across, and down into Westmoreland. And it's all Mountain Road. They tell me Westmoreland part of Mountain Road is in very, very bad shape. It's on fast, uh, sure run down. I, I don't know. Sure. But when we went to the mountain, when we got to that flat part, we went up the left side of the mountain, which that part of the mountain, Mr. Fratrick opened all the springs available, and it is very mushy, muddy, ucky. But, like I said, going up there, you can see places where there's some daffodils along here. So in all probability, at one time, 200 people lived on that mountain, black and white. And one man, he's now deceased, John Smith, he told me, I had ants as white as you, and he was a very dark man, and he said, I had ants as black as me. He said, but we were one family. So this is, you know, going up the mountain road, and I took a picture this man, he carved his name in there, uh, Joe, Joe, yeah, Joe, and Norman. And I took that because at one time there were there were Josephs and Normans on that mountain, and it's one of those chestnut trees that fell down. And then over here, um, this here is one of the powings. I have another picture with a whole lot of them. 
and they told me in the 20s and 30s that they had this big dance hall constructed up there and they would have a reunion that lasted two to three weeks and everyone would come in whether you were white or black you would come into this reunion and apparently they had much fun there <laughs> but the only thing left now are the pilings and uh, this was part of the spring house now the spring house we were told that in the summertime when you got milk out of the spring house it had ice crystals in it so that was some mighty mighty cold stuff and it was two stories the one of the brown um, men had told us he's probably my age and he said it was two stories they kept their meats and he said we never tried ice cream he said but you could probably keep ice cream in there it was so cold and I didn't go near it I did take a picture of it because I didn't want to fall in any place. <laughs> so I, did, I didn't go near it. I just took a picture. And we'll start these around. This starts going up the mountain. So you can keep track of that. There you go. Okay. And then when you get to the top of the mountain, uh, my husband kept saying, are you sure this is right? Are you sure this is right? I said, yeah, we just have to keep going. I know this is right. <laughs> so we finally got to the top of the mountain, and he had lost 50 pounds before this. And he was, and me, I was like, <gasps> having a heart attack. <laughs> so uh, when you get to the top of the mountain, this is the cemetery. And the state come in and fence the whole cemetery for us. And the man from the state that was in charge, he said, does anyone realize anything about this cemetery? No. He said, everyone is facing north. He said, in a Christian cemetery, they're usually facing east or west. But he said, this cemetery, and he kind of thought it was because of the black influence, they were all facing north. And uh, there are some, well, most of the stones are just like a field stone. And we were told the smaller the stone, the younger the person. The older persons had bigger field stones. There's only two tombstones there. One is John Smith, and the other one is John Brown. Now, John Brown and Orch Dorman and even George Dorman uh, from Sandyville served in the Civil War. And George was black. He served with the US uh, black troops. Uh, six, I think, was the number. His father and John, John Brown, they served with the white unit. They served with George Cabot out of Westmoreland County. And the reason that a black man could go to war, because they went to war, they were there a couple days after Lincoln declared war. They were in Harrisburg waiting orders. And the reason they could do that is because George Cabot personally took charge of the two black men. He bought them their uniforms, their food, their rifles, he supplied everything. When George was killed, they both left the 4th Cavalry. Um, John Brown went to the 54th Massachusetts, which was a black unit, and George Dorman went to the 6th, uh, where his son was stationed. And I didn't know about the black man couldn't legally go to war to 1863, but because um, there was a professor at uh, IUP that told me the black man could go to war because the fact that the white person in charge of the union was supplying everything for them. So these are just some pictures and when we inventoried the um, cemetery we got a total of 82 graves. Now whether there are more there or not uh, 
we want Al to go up because he can identify graves and he can tell you if someone is buried in you know that thing. So we were waiting for Lisa Garcia to get us to the cemetery, but I don't know what's going on. She's just like not available. So uh, we just might have to do it on our own one day, Al. <laughs> Go to the mountain when it's not too bad. But uh, like I said, there's 82 people, and in 1956, the state stopped burials there. They said no more burials. So there was a boy in 2012, he brought his mother's ashes, she was part of the Brown family, he brought his mother's ashes back here and he attached a cross to the tree. I haven't been up since, I really don't know if the cross is still there. But he buried her by that tree and he wanted that cross there for, you know, as a remembrance. And the last one that was born there, or buried there in 54, was a little boy by the name of uh, Daniel Brown. He was uh, four years old, and he died of some kind of tumor, something like Wilson's Wilms? Willems tumor, tumor. And there's a picture of him before he dies, and he, his stomach is just very, very large. And he was the last one to be buried there, and his brother, who looks like a white man, you know, in fact, uh, when a white person marries into a black family, if it's all black, it takes a while to come back to white. But if two black people or biracial have white in them, their children can be white, biracial, or black. And this accounts for a lot of things um, like, um, Oh, what was the name? Oh, Dinah Shore. <laughs> I thought about Dinah Shore. Dinah Shore, she had a black baby and in 1949, and her husband was Montgomery. I don't know if it was Robert or George or George. Whatever. George, was it George? Okay. George. And he was of Russian descent, and he said to Dinah, mm -hmm. no, 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 this isn't my family. But when someone did his tree in 2004 or six, somewhere along that line, when his Russian grandfather came to the United States in 1870 and landed in Texas, he married a negress. And they were usually referred to negresses if they were had prosperity and were very elegant, then they didn't refer to them as negro, but negress. And so that's why Dinah, who had black and admitted she had part black in her, that's the reason they have a black child. Because two white people, or two black people, that have white, you know, mixed genes in them can have all three shades. So her baby really belonged to her husband, not Sammy Davis Jr. And he got blamed because he was the only black man in Hollywood at the time. <laughs> so it, it's just very, very interesting. I had to study genes. I learned about genes from Megan Smolnick. Smolnick, I don't know if anyone's familiar with her, but she works on PBS, or she did. And she does a lot of uh, different things. And I had to learn about the you know genealogy type thing from her you know who's marrying what and, and what the results could be so this family is part black and part white today usually the white ones do not associate with the black ones although they're starting to mingle thanks to me uh, <laughs> I said oh but this is your cousin <laughs> You know, you have to get to know them. They are really superior people. <laughs> and even George Dorman, I mean, he always, he died in 1900. And his obituary, when I looked it upstairs, was covered an 8 by 11 page. And for an obituary in 1900 for a black man, we're talking unusual. Because even the white people usually had John Adams, son of so-and-so, died, will be buried tomorrow. <laughs> no. This man had an 
an 8 by 11 obituary on Virginia Avenue. Uh, all his neighbors were white. He was black. And he never lived on the hill. His children did. But he never lived on Laurel Hill. He had actually come here from Westmoreland County. And he came about 1881. And at that time, it was some sort of depression going on. Things were bad. Work was bad. And so they came to the Johnstown area. And at one time, you could go from Ligonier or Westmoreland County up Mountain Road, across the top of Mountain Road, down Mountain Road to Cambria County. And there's also the Fire Tire Tower Road. And also, if you continue on that road that goes straight out, it takes you to 271. And there was um, a cabin that burned in the 50s or 60s because when the state came in, they just tore everything down. And uh, this cabin burnt, and it didn't have electricity. It, it didn't have anything in it. So to burn, I don't know why. It could have been the kids, because kids always climb that mountain now, right? <laughs> I said, kids always climb that mountain, right? <laughs> and uh, do you have, do you remember seeing the cabin there? When they took us prisoner, they marched us up to the cabin. Uh, old man Brown was sitting on a rocker. That was his son. That was son. Okay. Yeah, that was his son. Well, he was like. Out of it. Out of it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he yelled at his boys for taking us up there. And uh, they, they were probably as much trouble as what we were. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he left us go, never to come back. And he said, we never want to see you up here again. <laughs> so. Yeah, the Browns were very possessive of that battle. Why were you taken prisoner? With the other boys, or is that a past life? <laughs> no, we, we were trespassing. Uh, me and my cousin, um, mm -hmm. do you know where St. Clair Road is? Um, I don't know where anything is. That was our playground, Mount Buckler. Um, we used to go up there, we'd go over to Great Run Fishing, uh, we'd go over to Swimming Bowl, over to Camp Slogan. But anyway, the Browns were further on up the mountainside, but they claimed everything. And the one day we were coming back from Gray Run, and two of his boys um, saw us, and they, they had rifles and shotguns and everything. So they <laughs> took us prisoner and <laughs> marched us up to the house. <laughs> And one of the Brown brothers actually shot one of the other Brown brothers. Yeah. A so good dog. You were what year was that? Exactly. What year was that? Well, it was 40. in the 50s. <laughs> yeah, it was sometime in the 50s, but they were fighting over a dog. Well, we, were, we were talking too with Ray one time. The, the old guy that had the wagon he used to come around in the West End, was that Mr. Brown? That wasn't Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown died in uh, 1946. So it was one of his sons. He had 17 children. So it was one of his sons. But I said, like, the ones that were dark stayed on the mountain. The light ones came to wherever. And as a child, uh, St. Clair Road was known as the Black Road. Everyone referred to it as the Black Road. I don't know if you remember that one, but that was always called the Black Road. And, uh, you know, like I said, uh, they served in the Civil War. They served in World War I, uh, the Dorman Boys from the Mountain. And at that time, uh, the black units were the ones that were in France at the, the lines, you know. And that one stated that he was under fire for four months, just constant firing. And when he came back to the States, he ended up at uh, a veteran's home out in Illinois, and he maybe lived a couple months and he died. He was fairly young when he died. 
So there, there was a lot of prejudice and a lot of whatever. And the one girl that I worked with, she had blonde hair, freckles. She has three children. Her two little boys have red hair and freckles. And she's a part of the Dorman family. And she went and talked to her mother and said, you know, this lady at work is telling me this history about the Dorman family, you know, and, and what's going on. And she said, I remember that man when we were little. He was a black man. And he always used to tell us, that blood in your veins, he said, black is mine, black is mine. And uh, so she told her mother, you know, what, what's going on? She said, my mother cried for three weeks. Then she finally fessed up. Yes, the family was black, part of it was white. And her husband looked at her and said, you know what, it's 40 years, we're married, it's too late to send the kids back. <laughs> and I always told her, I said, Elaine, you, her name was Elaine too, I said, Elaine, you have such a rich, rich family history. Because her mother, her great-great-grandmother was a runaway slave from Virginia. And they brought her to Bedford. And when part of the family, when I had some things here at the library uh, for Black History Month, uh, she called me up and she was asking me questions. And she said, did you ever hear of John Fiddler? And I said, yes, John Fiddler lived next door to uh, the Wallaces over in Bedford. I said, they worked the Underground Railroad together. And she said, you're the first person that knew John Fiddler. She said, we were always told about John Fiddler. This is like a black section of the family. and. Uh, they all tell me, they say, you know more about my family than we ever knew, you know. But this is simply because I found it so interesting to research. And like I said, they, they had a marvelous history. Of it. They went off to war, and, you know, they were very, very prominent people. Because, <coughs> you know, back in 1900, for one black family to live in a white community, that was... <coughs> That was fairly unusual. So, are there any questions? Yes, Diane. Cemetery <laughs> with these eighty some people. Does it have a name? I mean, you just call it the Brown Cemetery. Well, it's referred to in some of the Pennsylvania death certificates as Elmer Brown's Field. Sometimes it's Brown's Field. Sometimes it's Laurel Ridge. Cemetery. But I've been trying to track down all the death certificates of Pennsylvania that are buried in either Elmer Browns or Browns or Laurel Ridge or Laurel Hill, whatever they called it. And if it, what would be the address of that? Is it considered? I have no idea. Is it in Cambria County? Yes. Yes, the cemetery is in Cambria County. And I don't mean a street address. I mean it, it's considered Johnstown, PA. It would be Lower Yoder. Lower Yoder. Yeah. It's, it, it's in Lower Yoder. So. Is this the St. Clair Road thing you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's Elmore Brown or Laurel Ridge? Yeah. And, and, and find a grave that's under Laurel Ridge Cemetery. It, it does have coordinates to where it's supposed to be. Well, when the state took it over in the late 50s, they made everyone leave, you know. And they, they trashed the houses. They, they just dug up the roads. Uh, Were any of these bronze on the census records? Or yes. Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah. And you find them in Lower Yoder? Yes. Yoder. It was just Yoder at the time. Yoder Township. They were still there in the early 60s. Yeah. Yeah, but the state basically put them out. And a lot moved further down. Um, you know, as you're going up St. Teresa's, uh, there are some houses there and that. A lot moved in that. So. Do you remember where the old mine was going up the mountain road? Uh, Billows Airport? I know where Billows is. Yes. 
indicate across from the entrance to Billings Airport on the other side there's like three or four houses. Mm -hmm. If you go continue up the mountain road a little bit on the left hand side there used to be a mine right there. Oh. Okay. And then it had the mining, you know, the old mining cars, the yeah. wood ones, you know, the track that they would go in. We got thrown out of there too. <laughs> well, Elmer, Elmer had two white horses, and he would drink at that bar on Trefford Avenue. I can't remember what they call it now. Elco. Yeah, Elko. That's where Elmer went. And they said he would get so drunk, he would crawl in the wagon, he'd hit the horse on the rump and say, take me home. <laughs> and they said that he would, the horses would take him up Mountain Road, sometimes stopping at his daughter's house and sometimes taking him all the way to his house. Now, Elmer's house, it was passed down. And I have... I had a picture of it, I don't have it right now, but um, they believe it was George Washington's headquarters because the land was his, it was, you know, Virginia at one time, part of Virginia. And they had this great big room where the kids said they rode their bicycles, they played basketball, and they always referred to it as the banquet room. And after the boys came back from World War II, they did put a new roof on the cabin because it was, you know, really, you figure 1792 and here it is, 1945, you know, we have a lot of years in there. But uh, this room had a great big fireplace from what we were told and it did have wood floors eventually. When they were put in, I don't know, but lumbering, blacksmith, that was all part of their, uh, you know, life up on that hill. Plus, they also grew gross, uh, gross yeah, carrots and tomatoes and everything and brought the produce down to uh, a Moralville to sell. And the one man was referred to as uh, Sassy Press John because he always sold Sassy Press tea. But they, they just made their living off that mountain. And when you go up that one side of the mountain, it looks like someone took a giant knife and just cut the rocks. And that was what was laid down for that trail over to Ligonier. Even though Ligonier says that's not true. <laughs> you know. that, that trail goes over to Fort Bomber. I, I don't know where it goes to, but I know it went up that mountain, but they, they destroyed a lot of it the bulldozers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's only one section on that picture where you can still see about 12 foot of the road. So, I don't know. Did they make it or didn't they make it? Why did someone cut the steps in such a straight line? And once they laid the road down, they put about 12 inches of dirt on it. So when their case, caissons and cannons, you know, wouldn't see into the dirt and there was that stone base you know that they could still travel on. That's what they did over on Route 30 by the uh, ship hotel when they came up the mountain there was only one path and we were back in there at that uh, Perth and Fort. Fort Duol. Back in there. Yeah. yeah. They could move stuff if they want to back then. They had the manpower. Yeah. yeah. Well they say if you go to England and you go to the archives that you will find the name every fort that was in Richland, and there were about five Bedford forts in Richland, and they said you will find very detailed information. And someone said, why don't you go? I said, because I don't think they would let me move in. <laughs> 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 so, you know, but you, you can find the information if you really, really want to. And um, like I said, you know, one John Adams, his when he fought for the British during the French and Indian War, his uh, red jacket is down at the Smithsonian. So Elaine, did this whole this whole talk that you did, did that all come about because of the Norman request for research? Yeah. Oh, wow. Back in two thousand two, Jim 
Dorman wrote a letter to our group and said, hey, I'm a white man, I'm chief of fire department in Youngstown, Ohio, but he said, I'm doing genealogy, and he said, all my roots come back to Johnstown, it's black. He said, could there be two separate families, like with the same names? He said, so I thought, oh, one trip to the library. <laughs> it would be other. Yeah. And that's when I found the 8 by 11 page, <laughs> stating about the runaway slave and how his, his son, his first son served in a white unit. And uh, he was uh, blown up on the uh, St. James River in Eastbury, someplace down in that area. And uh, I just sent him all this, and ever since then, I have You should stopped. contact Hollywood Nation for the movie. <laughs> yeah, it would be very yeah. interesting. Yeah. It really would. And I hope mm -hmm. you ever have this, like, in a book. <laughs> I know, my husband keeps saying, when are you writing that book? I said, oh, who knows. First, I have to get you to put all this stuff up. <laughs> So we can show up on the screen. And like I said, you can see the paths, you can see where the houses were because there will be daffodils and uh, occasionally a lilac bush, you know. And how long ago were your pictures taken? My pictures were taken probably in 2008 or nine, Because my granddaughter was little and my camera I couldn't take any more pictures because she had 50 pictures of her Barbie dolls in different <laughs> positions on the camera before I realized that I wasn't going to get a whole lot of pictures. <laughs> yes. So, so who owns that property? The state. The state. It's Laurel Ridge Park. It's part of Glitzen Forest now. Oh, is it Glitzen Forest? Oh. We're take all over. Oh. I think okay. there's a sign on 56 that indicates that, that whole mountain range. <clears throat> You're fine about any about the speakeasy you had down behind Plaza and uh, Seward. Joyland. No. Joyland was the speakeasy. Well, yeah, it was on the other side. In Depression, uh, or from the 30s, they had the flicker uh, uh, rebound, what kind of call it. They had a speakeasy back in there. We were back in there, oh, probably before I got married, about 30 years ago. Grand guys. Yeah, there used to be a speakeasy back here. As you go down there, you get on 7 Eleven, get down to the plaza, mm -hmm. make a left, go behind the plaza, and there used to be poles back there that went nowhere, like electrical line poles. We have to step on it. Yeah, yeah, back in the 30s, they had a speakeasy back there. That's where they go drink the liquor. I didn't know about that, but I knew Joy that was a speakeasy. Yeah. It's like saying all of too down around 56. Well, St. Paula was a, an actual community, mm -hmm. a working community. And there must have been a lot of ginseng up on the hillside. Because you have to, it, I can't remember, if, I think it's a western slope you have to have. You have to have wild grapes there and something else, and you'll find ginseng. I don't know, my husband used to collect it all the time. Mm -hmm. The last time he sold it, uh, uh, he only had a couple pounds and he had $800 worth. So. Yeah, the guys who, who do that, they don't want to tell anybody where to find it. I know, I know. He only, he only tells my son where he can find it if he wants to. <laughs> so. But Joyland, going down 403, there's like nothing there. That's because the owners of the original Joyland bought all that land so no other speakeasy could come down that road. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any other questions? And Diane sent me that one picture about the Dorman before the 1889 flood. <laughs> it seems like you've been chasing these Dormans ever since I knew you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one Dorman refers to me as aunt. Miss Elaine, this is my aunt here. <laughs> oh, where did the name Dorman originate? Dorman, well, it, it's, it came from Holland, it came from England, it came from Ireland, it came from all over. But, it was like the interbreeding that really, you know, because there were white Dormans down in Virginia, 
And then there were two white boards over to Huntington County, and then they were black. So, something happened there. <laughs> Doesn't matter what color you are, you can fall in love with someone that's purple with yellow hearts. <laughs> So, it, you know, it, it happens. And like some of these people get, you know, and I said, hey, when you're doing gene genealogy, you just have to get your facts in a row. You can't judge why this person married this person or why they lived with this, you know, you can't judge. It's, it's strictly out of your hands. <laughs> when you say about getting your facts together, that bus tour that I was on, they, the ranger talked about the train in Connemaw in the 1889 flood. Mm -hmm. The engineer's name was John Hess. Mm -hmm. And the Park Service said they did tons of tours, probably close to three, four, or 5,000 kids. And one winter, one of their interns was looking at stuff, and they found out they had the wrong John Hess. There were two John Hesses that were engineers at the time of the 1889 flood. And one had one initial and one had the other initial. So yeah. they're in the process of trying to straighten all that out because they said even now if you go to that Johnstown flood memorial, they still have stuff on a wall and it's about the wrong John Hess. So one of their winter projects is to see what the story is on the other John Hess. Well, they say no black people died in the 1889 flood, but that is not true. I have found several that have, you know, so. Where did they live? Uh, most of them lived in Connemar or downtown, like Union Street. Uh, so they weren't people on that train, they actually lived in Connemar? Yeah, yeah. And most people don't realize that we had such a large black community early, early on before uh, the Slovaks and the Hungarians and the Polish were coming to this area. There was a black community established long before that. What happened to the Indian tribe that was originally here, the Kanwan tribe? Uh, a lot of them went to Ohio and then they got expelled because one of the Browns told us in their family history, they always said, don't settle in Johnstown. That's why they were up on the mountain, because they said it flooded too many times. Oh. And, and there were lots of floods. Uh, the one was about 1816 or something, they called it the pumpkin flood. Now they have a chronological list of all those floods. I was just at the museum last week. I had friends yeah. visiting. Yeah. Yeah. Because my husband, family, they were, you know, there was Indian, his family, and that's how they survived. Because when I was in fourth grade and I asked my teacher, I said, well, how did Samuel and Solomon and Rachel Adams, what happened? Oh, the Indians killed them. And my husband's grandfather used to say, well, how did they kill us? We bred with the Indians. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. I just never know about your genes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Joy. So, so the, um, <clears throat> the Browns and the Dormans that were able to assimilate and they passed, did they say on the census that they were white or did they say they were black? Well, the last sen census that Orange Dorman Jr. was in, he had a white wife and he was listed as white. His wife was white and all the kids were white. So it fluctuated because even that Elaine, you know, that I talked about, her grandfather was a Jacob Dorman. And when he was small, he was always listed as black. But then once he got older on the census, he was listed as white. And you can understand why people would do that to pass. I mean, the yeah. privilege was much greater if you. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. So. Like I said, some black, you know, married black and some married white, and we have this big conglomeration. The Crawleys, they, uh, they're part of the this Dorman family, and uh, the Wallaces, and they always said that Pauline Gordon said, 
don't dig up the past. She said, just leave sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> so we should look into her because usually when people say that, <laughs> well, well, you know, does she want to claim the white that's in her? You know, who wants to claim what? You know, I got my other DNA from ancestry and. 9% was that Asian, and 91% was Eastern European. Asian. Asian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, who knows? Who knows? You know. But then they change their uh, percentages, and everything changed. So I'm not 11% Scandinavian anymore. <laughs> Well, my kids had a big, you know, different percentages. I was the only one with 91 percent. So. so, are any other questions? Can I answer anything for anyone? I do just have a question about the library up at Penn Highlands. Are they open every day, like in the summer, or are they only open on certain times? Because I'd like to go up and go through the Democrat okay. papers that they have up there. They are open as long as they have school. Right now, the summer school is just to 4 o'clock, and then they close. Uh, so Monday through Friday until 4 o'clock. Probably yeah. 9 to 4, you think? Probably. Probably. Yeah. 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 How far back? Did they go see if he... Uh, yeah. Sometime in the 1880s. And they skip around. And some of them I have found, like she said, I, I would come here. Make you wait. Uh, and there they are on the line. And then this is his fourth and fifth and sixth cousins. Thank you. Very interesting. So, we'll conclude for tomorrow. And Al, I was there. 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 I was there.